So as we said, when we describe algorithms, we're going to, when we analyze algorithms, we're going to talk about how many computational resources they take to complete a task. That's one of the things that's interesting to us about them. And this really matters. Again, you know, you may have, you know, a cure, a, a way to like cure cancer, but if that uh, requires a computation that runs for a thousand years, you're going to be waiting for a while, right? So there are problems where speed really matters. It's not something we think about very much in your intro because we're teaching you how to write clear, concise code. But we do think about this as computer scientists because we have a limited amount of computer power and we want to solve problems, right? And so if the solution takes more power than we have, it's not really feasible, right? Um, the main thing we're going to talk about is computation. We'll also talk a little bit about memory along the way. Now, when we analyze algorithms, there are sometimes little features of algorithms, like some setup that the algorithm has to do, um, that don't scale with the size of the problem. So when we talk about complexity categories, we're usually talking about what happens as the problem gets really big. So you can think about this in mathematical terms as asymptotic behavior. There are certain functions that do weird things as they get started, but eventually start to behave, you know, as the problem gets bigger and bigger, we look at um, how it starts to behave you know, at the limit, right? And the reason is this allows us to ignore little aspects of setup, right? So an algorithm might do a few constant time operations to, uh, to initialize variables and then run a loop. And that loop gets bigger and bigger as the problem gets larger. So we'll, we'll show you an example of this in a minute, right? But we're usually thinking about what happens as the problem gets bigger. Like what's the relationship between the size of the problem and the runtime established as the problem gets very large so that we can ignore some of these setup costs. Um, we'll also talk about best case, worst case performance because certain algorithms um, have very, very big differences between worst case performance and best case performance. And an algorithm that's unpredictable can be as problematic as an algorithm that's slow, right? If I give you an input, let's say you're trying to design some system that interacts with the user, when they submit some data, sometimes the algorithm takes you know, a fraction of a second to finish the job, otherwise it takes a day. That's a big problem, right? A fraction of a second's good, right? But the day is gonna be like, and you need to know, right? If it's really unpredictable, that algorithm just might not be usable, right? So we'll talk a little bit about different inputs and how they can affect the behavior of the algorithm. Um, but overall, what we're interested in is, in general, what's the relationship between something about the problem and what we mean by size of the problem differs depending on the problem we're talking about and how long it takes to solve. Okay, so big O notation is our tool for categorizing things. This allows us to put things into categories. And this is, the categories depend on the relationship between the size of the input and the amount of times the problem takes. And these are rough categories. When you go on and you study this in more detail, you'll see that there are lots of like subcategories hiding in here and those subcategories can really matter, right? Um, I don't want you to think that the only changes to algorithm performance that matter are the ones that affect a complexity category. Like if you went to Google and you found a way to improve their search performance by even like 10%, you'd probably get a big promotion for that, right? So it's not always about moving things between categories. You know, small differences can also really matter, but from our perspective, we're thinking about these big categories, right? That have very, very, very different behavior. So here's a graph showing, comparing the performance of these uh, different categories, okay? And what, we're, what, what we see on, and again, exactly what these numbers mean depends on the problem. But the point is to look at the shape of these curves and think about how that relates to the size of the problem. So the size of the problem is on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, what we're graphing is how long the algorithm would take to finish the job. And the, the, um, unfortunately, the, the axis is uh, backwards. So on the right, you see different complexity categories that we're going to talk about, O1, O log n, ON. And then on the left, you see their performance. But O1 is actually way down there on the axis. You can't even see it. O log n is that red line that's right on the x-axis. Uh, the first one that you can really pick out is ON, because ON, you see, goes to 100 as it gets to 100. So the x-axis goes from 0 to 100, and you see that ON makes it to 100. Past that point, we see uh, algorithm categories that indicate even slower performance. So there's log n and squared, and these continue to go up and up and up. If you look all the way to the left there at ON factorial, I mean, that's almost like a vertical line. It's like a rocket ship taking off, right? And any algorithm that has that performance is going to be very, very difficult to use, even on moderate-sized inputs. 
The other thing I want to use this graph to point out is that if you look, I kind of want to point at it, but you're not going to really be able to see what I'm pointing at. If you look down at the axis there, at the x, y axis at zero, everything is fast, right? So on a small problem, even an algorithm that's going to eventually perform very badly, even the factorial, O n factorial, that just, you know, it's like a rocket ship taking off from the moon. It just goes like a vertical line. Even down at the axis at zero, it's fast, right? So with the small, and, and this can be, um, this is one of the reasons why we need to understand algorithms, because frequently when we test our systems, we test them with small inputs. And so it's like, oh, it was fine. You know, I ran the test yesterday and it completed right away. And your manager was like, well, we gave it a 10 times larger input and it crashed our entire system, right? You're like, oh, oh no, you know? So we, this is one of the reasons why as computer scientists, we need to understand how our algorithms are gonna perform, be able to make predictions about it, not just rely on empirical tests. Because usually when we test things, we use small inputs, everything's fast on small inputs, right? So all the algorithms are together down there at the axis. All right, so let's talk about a few of the categories. Uh, and these are categories, the different categories are going to be more or less important to us. For example, we're not going to talk about any ON factorial algorithms. Well, may, maybe one. There is one kind of fun one that we could talk to when we get to talk about sorting. Um, but for now, let's talk about some of the core ones. And we'll use some code examples here to give you a sense of what to look for when you are analyzing code. So O1 is called constant time, right? One just means one unit of work, right? And that unit can actually, it can be OC maybe, like a constant amount of work, right? There are certain computer operations that take a certain amount of time. So for example, array lookups. Typically the way that we will model them is that they are constant time. It does not matter how many elements the array has, when you look up something in that array, this is a constant time operation. Now, if the array gets bigger, it consumes more memory, that's a different type of resource, but the amount of time it takes to index into the array and to retrieve an element is constant. It does not depend on the size of the array. Now, this is great. Constant time algorithms are fantastic. The problem is most algorithms aren't constant time, right? Because most algorithms are composed of multiple constant time steps or other things. And so this is usually the algorithms that we talk about are not constant time, but there are operations like looking up a value in an index in an array, for example, that are constant time, or at least we treat them that way in this class. Okay, let's look at something more realistic, ON. So the ON complexity category indicates that the amount of time it takes to solve the problem scales with the size of the problem. So here's an example. This is a good example. This is summing the elements in an array. Um, so I've got an array of elements. Imagine that I filled that array with some data and I want to compute the sum of the array. Now, anything that needs to touch every element in an array or a list one time is typically ON, right? And if you think about it, there is no faster way to solve this problem, right? If I want to compute the sum of a bunch of numbers, I've got to go one number at a time and add it to the sum. I could go in some weird order, but there's really no way to make this problem any faster. I have to look at every element in the array. And in most problems where we do anything with an array, the best we can do is typically ON. Now that's not true universally. We'll see some examples where we can do better than this, but a lot of things like counting, max, min, if we don't know anything else about the array, like we don't know that the values in it are sorted or something, ON is typically the best we can do because there's a lot of times where you can't do anything faster than see every element in the array. There's no way to compute the sum without seeing every element in the array. All right, so, and that's that ON, ON is that green line, right? So that's, that's how that's going to scale. Um, now, what about this one, right? So here's a more interesting example. In this case, I'm looking for a value in the array. Assume that the array is filled with random values and I don't know where this thing is and looking for is a number that I've initialized. And I'm, this is a simple search, it's a linear search, okay? So in this case, I have something a little bit more interesting because there's a break statement inside my loop. If I go back and look at this loop, this loop is always going to run n steps. So if the array has a thousand elements, it's gonna run a thousand steps. If it has 2000 elements, it's gonna run 2000 steps. Here, how many steps it takes depends on the values in the array, because as soon as I find that value I'm looking for, I'm gonna break out of the loop. So now we get to think a little bit about sort of best case performance, worst case performance, and average case performance. So let's think about that. What's the best case performance of this little simple search algorithm? The best case is when the item I'm looking for is first in the array. So in that case, what happens is I enter the loop, I find the item, I break out, I'm done, right? That's great. 
I have one step, right? What's the worst case? Well, the worst case is either one of two things. Either it's the last element or it's not in the array at all. In which case I have to go through all the way through the array and look for every element before I give up, right? And this is another case where I can't do better than on if I don't know anything about the values in the array and how they're ordered because the value can be anywhere, right? So I have to look at every single item in the array before I can give up. The average case here, if I don't know anything about the values in the array and anything about looking for, is actually going to be on over two or something like that. Because let, so let's assume that looking for is in the array. If looking for is in the array, then on average, I'll get about halfway through before I find it. If looking for, if I don't know if looking for is in the array, then really the average case performance is on because a lot of the times I'm not going to find it, right? But this just gives you some sense of how, you know, this gets a little bit more intricate very quickly. Right, and, and there are some additional considerations in play. When we see something that's on over two, we're gonna drop the constant factor, right? So anything that's on over two is on for us. Anything that's O3n is on for us. We don't really care about the, the constant multipliers. Like, like I said, if you go off into industry and you take an algorithm that was O2n and convert it to on, someone is gonna be very happy. Um, but here, they're all in the same category for us, right? Because the shape, of the graph is the same. So let's go back into the, to the, to here. You know, anything that moves that graph and just tilts it is, is fine, but it's the shape of the graph that's interesting to us, right? And it's still linear. Okay, so here's an example of something that's on squared. And now what we're seeing is as the problem gets bigger, the amount of time that it takes is growing faster than the size of the problem. Um, and this is where we start to run into to, to some trouble. Um, now this is a poor implementation of a algorithm that checks to see if, the, if an array is sorted. And what you see here is that I've got nested loops. So I've got an outer loop that's gonna run n times and I have an inner loop that's also going to run n times. Now here, as soon as I find something that's out of order, I'll return false. So I may stop at some point. Uh, the inner loop can terminate early. Um, but in general, I've got these nested loops, an outer loop that runs n times, an inner loop that, that's run n times, right? And in general, if I need to look at every pair of elements in an array, if the array has n elements, there are n squared pairs. And if I have to examine every pair of elements for some reason, then I have an on squared algorithm. Now, this is not a good way to find out if an array is sorted. There's actually a much better algorithm for this, but this is just a, a silly example. And this is an example of something that, you know, if you wrote, you'd probably get in trouble because there's a better way to do this that's a lot faster and scales in OM. All right. One thing to look for when you're trying to identify. So when you when we go back and we see ON, a lot of times one loop, right? Uh, if we see a loop in the algorithm implementation, that's an indication that could be ON. When I see nested loops, now I start to think about on squared because I have to think about, okay, for every time the outer loop runs, the inner loop's also gonna run a bunch of times, right? Um, and so nested loops should make you think about an on squared. If I see another loop inside of it, now I might be on cubed, right? It depends on how deep the nested goes. Um, best case for this algorithm is that I find the unsorted element quickly. The worst case is that the ray is sorted, right? In the worst case, I actually get down to line nine and return true and I have done on squared's worth of work, right? Um, the, and the average case here is something around this, but it really depends on the elements in the array. And so now you'll see we're up to that blue line. Um, we've, we skipped over O n log n, we'll talk about that in a minute, but now we're up to that blue line. And you can see that, like, look at the difference between that, that blue line and the green line, right? Look at how quickly the performance of an on squared algorithm you know, diverges from the performance of an ON algorithm. This is the reason we talk about this, because this stuff really does matter, right? Those performance differences get really, really big, really quickly. All right, the logarithmic growth rates are ones that we'll come back to, because the log N in these typically depends on this uh, feature of a problem that we really haven't discussed yet, which um, has to do with, can we make it, uh, can we make the problem half as small? Right? So you might think about that canonical example of looking through a phone book for a number. Right? In every step, I can theoretically make the problem half as small. When I do something like that, that's where that log n comes into play. Yeah, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about these algorithms and we talk about some data structures that we're going to use to implement out the algorithm. And, and recursive algorithms frequently have this property. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry, we'll get there. One last thing about why this matters. Right? The reason it matters is because 
algorithms, dumb algorithms versus clever algorithms can move problems between complexity categories. So for example, a dumb algorithm for solving a problem will typically take the algorithm into a higher complexity category. So something that should be ON ends up as ON squared. Not good, right? This is the type of thing that gets you in trouble at work, right? Or it just means that the thing that you wrote that you thought was really cool, like, you know, a few of your friends are using your new app and it's working great, and then it starts to get popular and it's like the whole thing just starts to slow down and nobody wants to use it anymore, right? So, so bad algorithms have actually crashed entire companies, right? Um, there are actually some of the early social networks, I think, actually had this problem, right? There was a social network called Friendster that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of. Um, and Friendster was actually trying to do this really sophisticated graph calculus to figure out who you should be able to see in your network. And that got very, very slow as the graph got bigger and bigger. And I mean, Friendster had other problems, but there were early attempts at doing social networks that failed, I think partly because they ran into these really terrible performance problems and they ran into them when they got popular, right? Which is exactly when you don't want to have a problem. If your site only works well when only a few people are using it, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to change the world and take off, right? Because as soon as people start to use it, it slows down and then no one wants to use it anymore and you only end up with a handful of users. Okay, random digression, but a smart algorithm, on the other hand, takes something down in complexity category, right? It might take it down from like a, an ON to an O, uh, N squared to an ON log N, right? Um, there are different ways of computing the GCD, for example, right? Um, and the, the, the cool, the clever, I shouldn't say the cool, the, the correct way of computing the greatest common denominator of two numbers is actually O N log N. Uh, but there are brute force ways, kind of stupid ways of doing that that end up as N, N squared. And when you look at the difference here again, so N squared is the blue line and N log N is that purple line. Look at how big that difference gets as the problem gets big. All right, so, so this is enough on just a basic introduction to complexity categories and some of the features in your code that you want to look for.